So as we're, as, as everyone's coming in, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. This is really exciting. You guys are gonna be in for such a great presentation. Very, very valuable. Uh, my name is Christine Lee and I am the co-leader of the Daughterhood Circle in San Diego. My, my co-leader and I, her name is Karen Van Dyke. We, were, we started the very first Daughterhood Circle in the United States in 2015. And ever since then, since 2015, I want to say there's about 20, 20 circles or so um, now all throughout the United States and more forming. There's going to be, I was told that there are about four or five more circles forming just after Christmas around the new year. So um, it's really great that there are more communities for daughters and for caregivers that are going to be forming all throughout the country. And, I think so. Okay. Okay. I think good. so. So I, um, so I already introduced myself, but I, you know, just real quickly, I, I do want to point out the reason why, you know, I mentioned that I was, I'm, I'm one of the, the co-leaders of the Daughterhood San Diego Circle. And we, this, the reason why this came about was Karen Van Dyke, who's my co-leader and I, we were going to, you know, we asked Judy to be our presenter for our San Diego Circle. And once she showed us what her presentation is going to be, it is, um, it's so good and it's so valuable that we thought we can't just keep this in San Diego, you know, it, this needs to be shared throughout the entire daughterhood circle community throughout the nation. And um, that's why we're all here. So we're, we're so glad that Judy has agreed to not just present to San Diego, but to present to all of the daughters. And we're really blessed and thankful that she's agreed to do that. And um, you guys are going to get so much out of it. I know that, um, at least I know that for our circle in San Diego, Alzheimer's and dementia is really the primary diagnosis of why people come. You know, that's that's the support that they need. Um, so this is this is a great this is going to be a great presentation that you're all in for. Um, and Roseanne Corcoran, who is the Daughterhood Circle leader over in the greater, greater Philadelphia area, mm -hmm. she's also, if, if you guys haven't caught the Daughterhood Circle pod or the Daughterhood podcast yet, she is our podcast host and another such really just such a great resource for caregivers too. She's the host, the producer, the creator of the Daughterhood um, podcast. And um, she was also a caregiver for her mom, basically from 2009 till just this year, recently until she passed, right, Roseanne? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So very much knows the shoes that you are all in. <laughs> totally, totally. And I was fortunate enough to have Judy as my guest on Daughterhood, the podcast twice, which was a gift for me. Um, Judy, Judy Cornish is a triple threat. Uh, she's the founder of Dawn of the Dawn Method. She's an author and a retired elder law attorney. Uh, the Dawn Method is the kind, strength-based, person-centered approach to dementia care that trains families and caregivers to recognize the skills dementia does not take away. It's no surprise that the Dawn Method is built on kindness when you meet its founder. And Honestly, it's truly a pleasure to introduce my friend here, Judy Cornish. Yeah, it's a mutual pleasure, Roseanne. <laughs> thank you so much. You, you know, and, and Christine and, and Karen, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I always feel like I really don't have very much to say, and it's all very simple, and, and it's only going to take a minute. But then I find, find myself 90 minutes later having not taken a breath and having <laughs> been talking nonstop. So, so. Um, Thank you so much, you guys, for, for giving me the, the opportunity to talk about something so close to my heart. Um, so what I'm going to do, if you, if you have a question, write it down and then hang on to it until the end. Because the way I teach, I believe in experiential learning. I believe that we should be using all of our cognitive skills and that when we do so, we begin to understand what's happening to us when we begin to experience dementia in a more full way. And we as caregivers, if we're using all of our skills, then it's going to be a little bit easier. So, so this is going to be experiential learning. You don't have to take notes. You don't have to memorize anything. Just experience it with us. And um, so essentially what we're going to do now is 
take a journey. And um, as we go, I'm hoping I will be answering your questions after I raise them in your mind. So um, I'm going to now share my screen and we will be um, going through a PowerPoint. And I'm thinking this should take probably about oh, half an hour, 45 minutes, so we can save it, save lots of time. Okay, there we go. It mm -hmm. sounded like we stopped our, our recording for a moment there. So, um, so what, let me just begin by telling you how I got involved with dementia care because it's, um, it's a little different, I think, than most people. It wasn't one of my family members and it wasn't even a friend. I actually had um, moved from Portland, Oregon. I was looking for a way to um, practice law, part-time, semi-retire. I pictured myself li living in a small town somewhere very rural near mountains and that I would be gardening and um, skiing in the wintertime and practicing law maybe 10, 20 hours a month, elder law. That was the plan. And as I moved into Moscow, Idaho, and I was getting settled, there was a woman across the street and she was about, oh, I don't know, 65 years old, curly blonde hair, wonderful person. And she'd be out tending her tomatoes in the front yard. And so I went over to introduce myself and very quickly she was telling me that she'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And one of the things she was best at was being forgetful. And she had all kinds of great ways to um, help herself remember things. She had a very intricate note system. And one weekend her daughter appeared from elsewhere and uh, came over and introduced herself to me and said, um, we're gonna sell mom's house and put her in a care facility because she's just getting too forgetful. She keeps losing the car. And I said, well, you know, I'm not working. Don't make her move yet, let me help. And that's where it started. And I was very fortunate to be able to take advantage of a very unique opportunity. Um, I could put my career aside and for about five years, I spent most of my waking hours uh, with people who were experiencing dementia, but they were living at home. They were able to continue living their own lives. They hadn't been taken out of their homes and put into care facilities yet. Small town, um, you know, very, very, uh, uh, Moscow, Idaho was a very uh, friendly, peaceful neighborhood and people could continue living at home. And so at first I could see that, that people were experiencing something that seemed quite different to me than dementia. I'd heard about dementia, of course, we're all aware, we all hear that, you know, people begin to lose skills and, and then strange things happen. Um, and, and we, you know, when you look up the word demented, it actually has two meanings. It has the meaning of to be experiencing dementia, but it also is, the second meaning is to be crazy. And yet, as I got to know my neighbors and, and actually to tell you within a few weeks, I was not only helping my neighbor across the street, I was helping probably half a dozen um, elders, seniors, people who were living at home alone. And very soon I realized I'd started a business and I needed to hire staff, but I was not seeing people becoming crazy. I was seeing something else. And I think it was because I was able to put my career aside and just spend time with people who were living at home and beginning to experience this change in skills that we call dementia. So what is, we have to start at the beginning. Um, we all know that there are, that people lose their memory, but actually they're, they're technically, people are not losing their memory, they're losing their skill of remembering. And that's different. That means it's not gonna work if you try to jog my memory, give me clues. Because if I've lost the ability to use memory skills, jogging my memory doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Thinking, we know people lose thinking skills. And, and when we begin to lose the ability to organize information and make sense out of what's happening around us, 
that has a dramatic impact on our ability to interact with other people. And because those thinking skills that we're losing are, are rational thinking skills, and those include our use of verbal language, we, we become unable to communicate clearly and to tell people exactly what we need or to take care of ourselves. Um, this is, these are the, the, the ways we know this is what, what dementia looks like. And we see people begin to behave very differently and we, we see them begin to be unable to accurately interpret what's going on around them. And so these are, these are the areas, this is a pretty profound effect on a person's ability to uh, live, to interact, to take part in daily life, pretty profound very, um, very broad. It affects every area of your life. That's what it means to be experiencing dementia. Now, I think we become a little bit, or we've been a little bit confused when we're actually defining dementia here in the United States. We've, we've had the Alzheimer's Association for quite some time. And for about, you know, during the past decade, all of us have heard a lot about the, the need to cure Alzheimer's and the need to find a cure to do research and to isolate what it is that causes Alzheimer's so that we can cure it. And that I think we will, we will succeed in doing. I don't think it's gonna be much longer before we've identified a way to cure the disease that we know as Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease. But can we cure dementia? Can we get rid of dementia? I don't think we ever will. And the reason for that is that dementia is a condition and it's a condition that can be caused by Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a disease that always results in the condition of dementia. But dementia is not only a result of Alzheimer's. Dementia could be caused by a cardiovascular disease, by Parkinson's by any number of events, uh, a traumatic brain injury earlier in life or at any point in life will make it more likely that you are going to experience dementia. Um, so can a bad reaction to chemotherapy, a bad reaction to an anesthetic, um, even lifestyle choices can cause a person to begin experiencing dementia. We now know, we didn't know this 10 years ago, but now we know that if you're during your middle adult years, you were living a sedentary lifestyle and didn't get very much um, exercise, that you are more likely to develop dementia later on in life. We now know that um, processed foods, that um, uh, diabetes, these things can lead you to be much more likely to develop dementia. So can we cure it? No because it is caused, it's a result of so many different things. We're, I'm sure we will eventually cure um, Alzheimer's. We'll find a cure for, for Parkinson's disease. We will find cures for these things, but it's not just disease that leads a large number of people to be experiencing dementia later in life. And so because we cannot cure it, we're not ever going to be able to get rid of it. We need to figure out how to work with it. And that's what my work, that's what's kept me from um, going back to the practice of law, from retiring what I, like I thought I was going to do 12 years ago. Um, that's where my work with the Dawn Method, um, my books, my training programs for families, my certification programs for caregivers who work in agencies and, and facilities and work professionally for themselves. That's where my work is. We can work with dementia, but in order for us to begin working with it, we need to approach it differently because we all know that right now the word dementia is terrifying. And it is because of the emotional toll on the individual who's experiencing dementia, the emotional toll on the family members who love that person and attempt to help that person and the expense. In the, the United States, um, the expense of dementia care is astronomical. And so that's my work with the Dawn Method. What I propose is, and what I'm going to lead you through today, 
the journey we're taking today is we're going to look at dementia from a different perspective. And I propose that we need to choose a different model, a different model, one that allows us to look at dementia from the perspective of experience, what it means to experience dementia, what it means to define the problem that the problems that dementia presents as experiential rather than medical. And doing that in, in to me, in order to solve a problem that we cannot yet live with comfortably and we cannot yet resolve or cure or hope to cure is going to take defining the problem differently. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the, when we, uh, when scientists do, when they want to study light, you can set up a, an experiment so that you are looking at light as particles. You can set up an experiment so you're looking at light uh, as waves. But you get particles or waves depending upon how you set up the experiment. And so based on that premise, let's consider what models we could be using for dementia. Now we start with the one we currently use. Currently, we look at dementia and we consider it disease and we apply a medical model. So, so here's what a medical model looks like. Here's, here's what using, and this is actually the biomedical model because it applies, we use it in uh, both research and uh, with, with uh, medicine. But what we're doing when we say we are going to approach dementia from using the medical model is we um, turn to our doctors for help and we say, um, I, I need to, there's something wrong with me. I'm experiencing ill health. I'm, I'm experiencing something abnormal. And so I go to my doctor and I ask the doctor, I, give, I tell the doctor what I'm experiencing. And then the doctor with medical knowledge says, okay, um, it's time to run some tests because we need, I need to know a little more about what's going on with you before I can give you a diagnosis. And so you might go to your GP first for yourself or for a loved one. And you might say to your, your GP, you might say, um, you know, uh, my husband, uh, you know, my, my parent, my, myself, I'm worried because I keep forgetting things and I'm finding myself confused by things that I used to totally understand. And now I just, I, I, I can't, I have trouble remembering, but more, more than that, I find myself confused. And your GP in, in the United States is likely to say, well, here, here, answer a few questions for me. And so the GP will uh, lead you through a mini, what we call a mini mental, uh, a series of questions and 30 points. And um, based on that, your GP might say to you, you know, you only scored um, 26, 25, 22 points out of the total. And so I am concerned about you. I think you could possibly be experiencing dementia. I would like you to go see a specialist and the specialist will give you more tests. So off you go now to a neurologist. And once you go to the neurologist, they're going to give you a much uh, broader battery of tests and a neurologist should then be able to say, okay, we've taken you through all this testing. Um, I believe you have, are experiencing Alzheimer's disease or dementia um, as a result maybe of cardiovascular disease. But here's the first problem. You've gone, through, you've gone to your GP, you've now gone to a specialist, you're looking for a diagnosis and they can only say probably. They can only say probably because in order to really give you a definitive diagnosis of whether or not you're experiencing Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia, caused by something else, we would need to do a biopsy. And we, of course, can't do that. We cannot biopsy your brain. So you, your diagnosis is going to be a most likely. It is likely. It is probable. It seems to me, the neurologist, your specialist, it seems that you're experiencing Alzheimer's disease, or, or I believe you are experiencing dementia. Okay, so now we've got diagnosis. We've gone through tests and diagnosis. So now what do we need now? If we have a disease, if we've been diagnosed with something that is a disease or a condition, well, then we're looking for symptoms. We need symptoms in order to be able to truly be able to see whether or not that's which disease you're experiencing. And so 
when we're experiencing dementia, there there's changes, but you know, it's not that there's swelling or a wound or um, you know, a lump or you know, some kind of a, a specific headache, uh, something physical. It's not physical, it's actually behavioral. Because people begin to behave in different ways. And so, so what we've ended up doing is we, we are still using this medical model and we've come up with a probable diagnosis. We've come up with a series, quite a few different types of tests that we could test um, your memory and we can test your thinking, um, your exercise of thought, rational thinking, we test that. But now we're looking for your symptoms and we are stuck with behaviors. Okay, well, that's all right. We carry on with our model and we are going to give those behaviors names. And we call them dementia related behaviors. And quite a few come to mind right away. Uh, you know, there's, there's um, uh, restlessness, um, exit seeking, sundowning, uh, combative behaviors, confabulation. And, and we have, we've named and we've, we've come up with labels for quite a few symptoms of dementia, but they are all behavioral. Now these, these behaviors then that are the symptoms, it's behaviors that we design treatments for. And so, so now we are going to continue with our probable diagnosis. We've done the best we can with testing and we are now going to treat behaviors. And what happens with, with a behavior, I can't, you can't treat a behavior with surgery. You can't treat a behavior except with a drug. And so when we take this, this medical model and we apply it to dementia, we end up with a really expensive emotionally and financially approach to resolving and dealing with and treating dementia. We look at dementia and we say it's changing the person in the following ways. And we've got those labels for their new behaviors. And we're going to call them symptoms. A lot of these behaviors, you know, because people are not able to think clearly and they can't recall what was just said or what just happened an hour ago or a year ago or five years ago. And so they're misinterpreting what's going on in the present. They're very confused about what reality is more and more. Uh, confused as time goes on. They become less able to perceive risk and so they constantly put themselves at risk and everybody around them. Um, they end up mismanaging money and mismanaging, uh, you know, relationships are broken. All of these things happen and they're all negative and they're all expensive emotionally and financially. And so what do we do? We, we approach that by normalizing those behaviors and we must use drugs. And the drugs that normalize or reduce behaviors are psychotropic drugs and mood altering drugs, um, drugs for depression, drugs for mental illness. They're not actually curing dementia. And they're actually not affecting that emotional pain, which underlies those behaviors. When we try to normalize a behavior with a drug, what we are doing is making the person less able to express their emotional pain. And the emotional pain remains in them. And that's not enough. It's not enough to, to simply uh, medicate somebody until they're not able to uh, behave in a negative manner we have to also start thinking about providing a facility, providing some kind of a situation where you can lock the doors so that they can't mis um, misunderstand where home is. And be when we become un unable to perceive what is familiar. Uh, and, and so we begin to think about finding a facility that we can put our loved one in so that they can be confined uh, for their own safety. And, and for um, the safety of those around them. So this model is what we've been using and it, it results in tremendous emotional pain and, and expense, financial expense. The model's purpose, the biomedical model, the purpose of using that model is to return a person to, to health. It's to treat, it's to cure. And so if I were to be experiencing cancer, say, let's say, you know, if I were to have a swelling or a lump 
and um, I was concerned about it. And I'd go to my GP and the GP would say, hmm, yeah, that doesn't look good. I'd like you to go see an oncologist. And off I go to the uh, specialist. I would want them to run all the tests and then to tell me everything possible about this cancer of mine. I want to know what type it is, how far it's spread, um, and all the treatment options. And that's because we do have treatments for cancer. And if you tell me everything you can learn through, through the testing, that's wonderful because then I can make a choice, an educated decision about the treatments I want you to do for me to help me uh, experience. And so, so when we do have treatments, it makes sense to use a medical model. But what about when we don't have a treatment? What about when we don't have a cure? If you can't cure me of dementia, that means I must live with dementia for the rest of my days. I am going to die with dementia, even if I die of something else before I die of dementia. That's the difference. And so to me, is it logical for us to persist in applying a medical model to a condition for which we have no treatments, let alone cure? And really, should we not be looking at the experience of dementia and those of us who are experiencing it and those of us who will be experiencing it in the future? Should we not be more concerned about providing care? And care is the purpose of a different model. It's not the purpose of a biomedical model. So now let's look at that model that is used for the goal of providing care for when we cannot cure somebody of something, when they must live with it. So what, what do we do then? It's when it's not appropriate because there is no treatment. Now we start thinking about how we can preserve quality of life. We want this individual who we've, are, we've identified that they are experiencing dementia, we've got an idea of what, what may have caused it or what type of dementia it might be, but we are really concerned now about their quality of life because we know they are going to have to live with it until the day they die. And so we need to know how they're experiencing what, what they're feeling and what their experience is in situations. And so now we need to know how, what the person can do and what they can't do. And we need to think about what their emotional needs are going to be because we know that dementia is going to be changing their ability to use memory skills. And we know it's changing their ability to use rational thinking skills. And, um, and actually, Nobody talks about it, but we know it also affects our ability to use our attention skills. There's five different types of attention skills, and we lose three types of attention skills to dementia. Um, the, 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 these skills we are losing are going to affect us emotionally. We are going to have emotional reactions to this loss of skills, but we can't hear it. So we are then thinking about how we can maximize quality of life and what we want to do. Our expectation changes from being, I can treat you and change your symptoms. Our expect expectation now changes to, I understand that I cannot provide a treatment or cure you. Therefore, I'm going to change the environment expect you to behave in the way that you are best able to behave based upon your abilities, what you can and cannot do, and your emotional reactions to these changes you're going through. So when we apply that model to dementia, we start with a different analysis. Now we are thinking about quality of life. I'm not going to be able to return my loved one to normal functioning. No matter how many times I try to jog her memory, no matter how many times I contradict him and say, no, 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 that's not what happened. No, you don't understand. No matter how many times I say that, I, I can't get them to change their behavior because they are losing the skills they need in order to comprehend what I'm saying, in order to understand why, or in order to be able to bring back that knowledge from the past. And so my goal now is maximize quality of life. I'm not trying to change you. And so I know that the way you're behaving 
reflects how you feel. Because I know you're experiencing the loss of skills and your interpretation, your ability to interpret what's going on around you is fading. You're losing the very skills you need to properly and accurately interpret the present. And yet at the same time, you're still living with me in the present. You're still in the present and experiencing it. And so then we begin to think, well, what can we do to change the environment so that this person continues to enjoy life to the best they can? And the more they, more comfortable they are emotionally, the less stress I'm experiencing and the more comfortable I am also emotionally. And so when you think about this model, this is known as an experiential model. And anybody who's raised a child has already applied and used this model in a caregiving situation. Because this is how human beings have been raising children for since the beginning of time. We have been using this model. It's very appropriate and most of us already know how to do it. And so that to me is why we want to reconsider our approach and it has to start there. And that's why it's a journey. It takes me eight weeks to teach the Dawn method to a family or to teach the Dawn method to a professional caregiver because I have to take you on a journey that begins with this reconsideration of how we define the problem. But think about why this is appropriate. It's appropriate because we don't have treatments, we don't have cures. All we can do is numb people's ability to express their emotional pain. That's all, that's all we're doing when we apply drugs. And, and because there's no treatment to cure, the, the person who's experiencing dementia is going to live with it. But, but just, you know, when you think about the stages of life, we, there is, there's childhood, there's adulthood, and there's elderhood. And, and in the United States, we've forgotten about this, partly because we've, you know, segregated generations and the, um, you know, social security uh, was a wonderful boon in the 60s. It, it was to give our elders uh, uh, money, but it also meant that they were able to not live with their children. And so many generations, three generations now in the United States have grown up in a two generation home and without understanding what it means to be an elder. And, and yet, when we're children, we are going through constant changes. We accept that. We adults know that childhood means that that person is experiencing changing skills, changing cognitive skills, and changing emotional, and, and a changing emotional maturity or emotional skills. So children are gaining in skills, and children are gaining in emotional maturity. Your elders, all of us, whether we experience dementia or not, are, are beginning to lose physical skills. And, and being an elder is being at the, the, you know, life is a bell curve. Being an elder is being at the other end of the bell curve. Life is not a trajectory. I, I think we forget that. You don't gain skills, gain skills, and then die someplace at the top of the trajectory if you live a natural lifespan. You gain skills as a child, as an adult, you live more stably. And then as, adult, as an elder, you're losing the skills. But when skills are in transition, those of us who are adults, those of us who are providing care for children, for elders, we need to keep in mind that this is where it's appropriate to, to use a model that supports the person's experience. And you know, the best part about it is you don't have to go to college. You don't have to become a doctor. You don't have to become a neurologist. You don't even have to be a certified nursing aide. And you could even just be a lawyer like me and still get it. That, that you could still look at the person and evaluate their skills. Which skills do they have? Which skills do they, are they losing or which skills have they already lost? And, and how, can I, how can I support quality of life? How can I make life good for this person based on where they are currently at? with their skills, just as we do for children, um, raising, constantly changing the situation for a child. You know, like you think about it, think about um, you know, when you welcome your, uh, an infant into the family, that little person doesn't know your name. That little person can't talk. 
They can't take part in a conversation. They don't have a clue who anybody is in their lives. They don't know their relationship, the names, the history. They've got no knowledge of the past. They come, they're just a blank slate. And, you know, actually, dementia takes us there eventually, doesn't it? But for this infant, for the little infant, we all, we love them, we hold them, we meet their needs, we evaluate their emotional needs, and we think about their skills, and we carry them everywhere. And we provide naps, and we provide food that is, uh, you know, they don't have to chew because they don't have teeth yet. But then when that little person is a two-year-old, we're providing different supports. And we've been watching their emotional needs and we watch as things change. The two-year-old is still taking naps. Um, we've got um, outlet covers uh, covered for safety. But when that little person's 12, we don't require naps and uh, we don't have covers on the outlets or, or you know, drawer pulls. We're not giving them car keys yet, but when they're 15, 16, we start giving that person, that child is going to be given car keys. And so this is us just looking at another person who's going through changes, changes in their skills, cognitive skills, and we're supporting that. We change our expectations to support their skills where they are. That's the experiential model. And to me, it's logical to begin looking at dementia from the perspective of, of experience and to, to give up trying to force this condition that is caused by so many different diseases or events um, or, or um, lifestyle choices and trying to force it into a medical model. Instead, we could apply the experiential model and focus on quality of life. So, in order to do that, we need to flip the coin. And now we need to think about what does it actually mean to experience dementia? What's going on? What happens when we do begin to experience this condition? Because as people, you know, at first, mild cognitive impairment, you know, it's, it's hard to see the difference between normal aging and uh, the slowing of skills, physical and, and um, memory and the beginning of mild cognitive impairment, which is going to develop into dementia, but eventually it becomes clear. So what, what is going on? And, and I think this, um, for me, being able to see this was the result of, of two very uh, specific life experiences, maybe three. Um, you can add, uh, see, I'm doing it again, I'm talking too much. So ask me if you want to know in questions later, but I worked with sheep and I learned more about dementia from working with sheep than um, than ever working with people. And I went to law school on a very, very short notice, about three weeks notice, I ended up in law school. And, and then getting to spend time with people as they were experiencing dementia before they had to move, before they got moved from their own homes where they were very well versed in uh, navigating daily life as a person living in, a, in their own home compared to being moved into a group living situation, which is owned and run by a corporation and managed by employees. Very, very different lifestyle. So um, what I came to understand and what I began to see, and I've reorganized this slightly now, to look at what we lose. Looking at dementia, when, if you look at it from the point of, point of view of functioning, what do we lose? Well, we lose those attention skills. And we lose language skills because that's part of what goes with our rational thinking and our, and our memories. We lose uh, vocabulary. But if I'm losing attention skills and language skills, that's going to affect every interaction with another person. No matter how simple this conversation was, whether I just dropped by the post office to buy a stamp, if I'm losing attention skills and language skills, that will affect my ability to interact it'll affect every relationship. Because when I try to explain to my uh, spouse of many years, and I don't have the language anymore, that will change our relationship. Judgment and perception. Now judgment and perception, that's part of thinking skills. It's very specifically part of rational thinking skills. But if I'm losing judgment and perception, I will lose the ability to make good decisions. I'm going to lose the ability to perceive risk. And as soon as somebody loses the ability to perceive risk, they, they are not safe on their own. 
they need help. They need help without notice in a moment. And so that affects every task, every part of self-care. Everything I attempt to do from getting up in the morning to making a cup of coffee to deciding whether or not I should get the keys and get in the car and drive downtown by myself. But memory skill and memories. Now, if I lose the ability to remember, if I lose the ability to, to retrieve information from the past, and now I'm on, I cannot recall what was said moments or minutes or hours or days or years earlier, that means that I will misinterpret what's going on in the present. Because everything we know about what's happening right now is shaped by what we know was said a moment ago or who, who left the room an hour ago or what happened 10 years ago. When these things go, people lose the ability to properly interpret reality. And so we end up living with our, all of our relationships are up in upheaval, our ability to stay safe has gone and we are now unable to perceive reality. That's pretty catastrophic. That's bad news, but the good news is this, and this is the first learned law that I learned when I was spending time with people who were experiencing dementia and living at home. I knew they were losing skills. Clearly, they were losing skills, but they weren't losing them all. And after, it took me probably, I don't know, six, eight week, months before I began to put it together and, and think about these other life experiences I had had. And the first thing that, that occurred to me, the first thing I saw is functional changes for these people, my neighbors that I began spending time with there in Moscow. I saw them going through exactly the opposite experience that I went through when I had to go to law school on short notice. My undergraduate degree was language. I wanted to be a language teacher. When I was in high school, I was an artist. I always played the piano. I wanted to, uh, I, all of my education and experience was based on music, art, language, language acquisition, literature. And all of a sudden, I had to go to law school. And all of my skills to that point, they didn't matter. Nobody cared. When they didn't want me to write papers and do research and, and have an opinion on something. I had to just simply take the law and take the facts of a scenario, a situation, apply the, the facts to the law, apply the law to the fact, come up with a, uh, the result. Rational thinking. And I did not have those skills. And for me, that first year of law school was one of the most painful years of my life. I was ill-equipped. I was being required to use rational thinking when I was much better at using intuitive thinking. And my friends and neighbors there in Moscow, they had the same emotional reaction I did. My emotional reaction, I just was absolutely miserable. I was very stressed. Fight or flight was very activated for me. And it was, it was flight. I was miserable that first year. People who are experiencing dementia, they find themselves unable to use rational thinking skills that they've been using their entire lives. And when we can't use skills and we find ourselves unable to go into our own kitchen in the morning and make a pot of coffee using our own coffee maker, it's scary. People are reacting with stress reactions, fight or flight. And so being unable to access those skills and required to use intuitive skills. And many of us don't even realize that our intuitive thinking skills are our primary thinking skills. And we're not really well versed at using them. This is what's happening. And, and for me, that pattern, that was the first pattern I saw, but that's where I began to realize dementia is not making people crazy. Not at all. There is a pattern. It doesn't matter what what the cause of my dementia is. It doesn't matter what particular type of dementia I'm using. If you look at dementia from the perspective of function, the way it changes the way the skills people have and, and the way it changes their ability to function, then there is a pattern and then it becomes something you can work with. 
it becomes something you can recognize the person's skills, intuitive thinking. They, people become really good at using their intuitive thinking skills as they go deeper into dementia. And it's because they're forced to, because they've lost the rational thinking skills. But we actually keep the best, the best thinking skills. And then the next one I began to understand and realize, and actually if, if you know, if it, I can give people a book list later, but if you want to read about intuitive thinking and rational thinking on the level of a neurologist, Ian McGilchrist's book, The Master and His Emissary, is your, probably your best neurology to read, you know, what's going on in the brain. Um, Daniel Kahneman, he wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, and he calls rational thinking and intuitive thinking system two and system one. But he talks about the remembering self and the experiential self. And I had this aha moment, oh, I don't know, three, four years in to spending all my time with people who are experiencing dementia. And I suddenly realized, wait a minute, that that whole thing about, you know, it doesn't matter what I do because she's not going to remember it anyways. That's not true. It always matters. It always matters because we have two selves. We have the part of us that is equipped with memory skills and able to access all that lifetime of knowledge about our past, our past experiences, what we've studied, what we've watched, what we know, who we know, their relationship with us, all this stuff that we all have that's familiar to us and makes us feel at home. That's the remembering self. On the other hand, we all also have an experiential self. And our experiential self is that part of us, and I think it's our soul, it's the essence of our humanity, it's the part of us that is eternal. That part of us is 100% present, experiencing the present at all times. Daniel Kahneman says the psychological definition of now is about three seconds. And if you spend enough time with somebody who's experiencing dementia and you're with them to the point where they completely lost their memory skills and they've completely lost their rational thinking skills, you find yourself living with somebody who lives in the three second now. No ability to access past because they've lost their memory skills, no ability to plan or anticipate or initiate activity for the future because they've lost rational thinking skills. And so we, when we begin to experience dementia, we remain fully equipped with our intuitive thinking skills and fully equipped with our experiential self. And it does matter what happens to us, because even if we can't remember who did it or what happened or what was said, we experience it. And when we experience something, we have emotional reactions. And whether I can remember what you did to me or not, I am going to have an emotional reaction to you based on what happened. And if I don't have rational thinking skills or memory skills, I'm probably going to misinterpret it. Now, here in the United States, we've heard a lot about mindfulness in recent years. And that's because we are really not good at using our experiential selves. We are really preoccupied with the past and we deify memory skills. And we're really preoccupied with the future and trying to plan for the future using our rational thinking skills. But really mindfulness, mindfulness is the ability to manage your, all five of your attention skills, to choose where to put your attention. And when we have the ability to choose where we're putting our attention, if we are exercising mindfulness, generally what that means is that we are trying to be more aware of the present and more grounded in the present. And, and why? Why do we do that? It's because everything wonderful is in the present. Companionship, that's in the present. It's not in the past. It's not in the future. Beauty. All the beauty that our, our senses bring to our awareness, it's in the present, it's not in the past, it's not in the future. And so that's why mindfulness is a really wonderful thing. Now, if I'm experiencing dementia, I'm losing my ability to maintain my attention on something at will, to redirect at will, and to direct at will. And if you spend time with somebody who's experiencing dementia, you know what I'm talking about. There's those things that you just cannot make them forget. It's constantly in their minds. It is always leading them, and they, they are being led, forced by this inability to manage their own attention skills. But they still have focus. They, they still have intensity. 
They haven't lost that. But the other things they haven't lost is the ability to use the mindlessness tools. Now, this comes from Ellen Langer. Um, she's a uh, Daniel Kahneman, that would be uh, Princeton, Ellen Langer, Harvard, the Mindfulness, um, uh, Langer Institute of Mindfulness, and I think there's 12 of them around the world now uh, through Harvard, but um, she talks about the tools of mindlessness. We all benefit from mindlessness tools every day. They are incredibly valuable to us as human beings. We have muscle memory and we have automatic thinking scripts. And it becomes critically important that we understand what those two skills are when somebody loses rational thinking and memory skills, because being able to be remain in your familiar environment and use your muscle memory and use your your automatic thinking scripts allows you to function at a higher level for longer. So it's really important that we start looking at dementia and understanding what these skills are. Now, I'm going to go through this quickly because I really want us to have time to chat. But if you're a caregiver and you're spending time with somebody or, you know, if you love somebody and you're a companion of somebody who's experiencing dementia, they're going to the most frustrating things for you, whether you understand and, and it'll be less frustrating when you understand what's going on, is these three right here. When I lose my rational thinking, I'm going to lose the ability to perceive cause and effect. So there's no point telling me I need to put a coat on when I'm standing inside inside the building and it's 70 degrees, because I'm not going to get it. Not even if you show me that out that window, there's snow falling. I'm not going to put two and two together because I lose cause and effect. Sequencing. Don't tell me to go put on my shoes and socks. Don't even tell me to put on my socks and shoes because I'm going to lose the ability to see that you do this and then you do that. And even if it's only two things, it's too many. And you've confused me, you put me on the spot, you've embarrassed me, you've frustrated me. And boy, if we're talking about spouses, that does not work well, does it? But the really frustrating one is this loss of prioritization, to be able to prioritize ideas and actions. If I can't prioritize, there is nothing you can tell me that will convince me that I should put down my coffee cup and go take a shower. Because I enjoy drinking coffee. I like my coffee and I'm not putting it down. It's, it's these things. If we understand this when we are companions, when we are caregivers, we can take the, the frustration out and begin working with it. And when I keep my intuitive thinking skills, it's really important that you know, if you're my companion, that all the sensory data, everything I see, hear, taste, touch, and smell, it's all coming in. I'm receiving it all. But if I'm losing rational thinking, I'm losing the ability to interpret it. If I'm losing memory skills, I'm losing knowledge of what it means. I can't draw on that, but I, I continue to receive it. So if you can make sure that the sensory data coming to me is what's beautiful to me, I'm gonna be really happy. I'm gonna be really comfortable. And feelings, I'm not losing intuitive thinking skills, so boy, am I ever equipped to read your nonverbal communication. I am reading it loud and clear, and if I wasn't good at it before, I'm really good at it now, and I'm getting better at reading your nonverbal communication every day. And the four Fs of stress, fight or flight is what we've always talked about it, but it also includes freeze and fawn. And when somebody's losing cognitive skills and when everybody around them expects them to keep on understanding and behaving and comprehending and recalling, and they can't, then they're going to be giving us stress reactions. It's we're going to be getting those fight or flight reactions or freeze or fawn. And so this is um, part, this is how to look at dementia from the perspective of a person's experience, what they're experiencing and how we can support that. It takes time. This is different. You know, uh, to be the companion of somebody who's experiencing dementia is different than anything you've ever done before. And if you've known this person for a long time, they are, it's, they're, they're dancing a different dance. It is not the dance the two of you danced for the last decades. It is all different now. And, and dementia is paradox, but it makes sense when we begin to look at it from the perspective of what's changing in their ability to function.
So this is the first principle, the most important thing for us to understand if we spend time with somebody who's experiencing dementia is they're losing skills. Yes, they're changing. Yes. But it's not random, it's not disordered, it's predictable, and there is a pattern, and there's a way to work with it. Loss of skills causes emotional distress. That's the second law that I learned spending time with people experiencing dementia. It's not my behaviors that are the problem. It's how I feel. My, my feelings are being expressed in my behavior. If you mute my, be, my ability to demonstrate my feelings, you are leaving me in incredible emotional pain. Um, it's, to me, this is one of the most cruel things that happens, is we don't understand that even if we can't express, even if I can't explain, even if I don't no longer know the word for sad or for afraid or for um, terror, I feel it. I'm still feeling it. And the other thing that I think is so critically important to understand is that when we're experiencing dementia, we could also be experiencing anosognosia. So I'm not being difficult. Anosognosia, anosognosia means that I've become unable to perceive changes in my cognitive skills or physical skills. People become unable. If dementia is affecting the part of the brain that allows your loved one to have self-knowledge, then when they say, when they insist that they do not have dementia, when they insist that, even though that doctor, you know, you went back to the doctor, you got a diagnosis, you made them listen, you've had the doctor write a letter that says, you have been diagnosed with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease, and they still refuse to believe it, it's not because they're just trying to give you a bad time. It's not because they're having personality changes. It's nothing that's based on disease. It's based on this condition, anosognosia, the fact that they have their, their dementia has made, the, made it impossible for them to perceive the changes that are occurring in their cognitive skills. And so this causes, this defines how we go, how we approach being companions providing care. And so here, this is, this is the dawn flower, and it represents the emotional needs that are caused when we begin to lose very specific skills. And these, these are the seven tools of dawn. And, and each of these, you know, I mean, why, is, why mood management? Why is that in the middle? Well, that's because we, as human beings, we use memory skills and we use rational thinking skills and, and attention skills to a degree to manage your own moods. But dementia takes those skills away. And so the person who's experiencing dementia then is unable to manage their own moods. And so if we are the companions, we need to take on that task. We need to be in charge of that. And we need to recognize, we need to be aware that because our loved one is becoming unable to manage mood, we are in fact already in charge. And our nonverbal communication, what we say nonverbally, has a tremendous impact on the mood of our companion who is experiencing dementia. It's the only time in, in any relationship where you actually are affecting and are responsible for the mood of another person is when they don't have the skills to resist your moods or to manage their own. Each of these areas, to me, the, the represent an emotional need. And, and you know, here it is, I'm, I'm presenting it to you here in a slightly different manner, but you know, the previous slide and this slide are exactly the same, exactly the same information. The difference is this slide presents the information for your rational thinking skills. And the previous slide presents the information for your intuitive thinking skills. Your loved one retains this. They've lost the ability to use the tools that you, you, your brain was using on the previous slide to recognize order, relation, comparison, and uh, 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 grading, grading of importance. So, so this then is the Dawn tools. Now it's broken into two parts and the center three tools reflect security needs. Uh, Abraham, Abraham Maslow, 
1942, he wrote his paper about um, the, the hierarchy of human needs. Yeah, the, the, that pyramid, not, not very accurate. It's actually a feedback loop. And that's what this, this flower is, it's a feedback loop. The, the principle is correct. His principle was correct, even if the model was a little faulty. We human beings, we don't feel happy for long if we feel at, at risk. If we don't feel safe, we are acting out of stress. We are expressing fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And when people without rational thinking skills or memory skills are misinterpreting the present and they're reacting with fight or flight, it's unpleasant for everybody. So we need to think about these security needs and we need to meet these security needs. If I'm experiencing dementia, I'm losing memory skills, I'm losing rational thinking skills, I am going to have to learn to feel safe even though I'm going to be increasingly confused. If I'm experiencing dementia, you can't cure me, you can't treat my dementia. I am going to need to learn how to feel safe even though I need help, security and care. And then the outer part of the dawn flower, these outer four petals, this is just well-being. This is just four ways that if we are feeling safe and secure, you can make my, if I feel safe, you can make my life beautiful in any of these four ways in a few seconds. And if you do, if you're giving me a sense of, of well-being in these four areas, then over time, I am going to become comfortable again. I am going to begin to feel safe. I'm going to feel safe with you. And when all, when my skills, my memory skills are totally faded away, when my rational thinking is totally gone, I will still be able to enjoy my time with you. And so looking at dementia from this perspective, which skills do people keep? Which skills do people lose? Okay, how do I support the ones they've lost? How do I stop asking my loved one? How do I stop putting them on the spot and demanding that they use skills they no longer have? How do I stop igniting fight or flight? And that's what it means to work with it. And you know, it's just like physical pain. If you've ever had to live, learn to live with physical pain that you couldn't uh, eliminate, cure, treat, then you know that it works better, that there is a way to work with it. You stop resisting and you start working with it and it's not as bad. And that's, to me, is, is the, the best analogy for, for working with dementia is we, we start to become aware of what is actually happening to that person we love. And then when we do, we change our expectations and we stop demanding that they behave in ways they no longer can, but we stop asking them to do things they no longer can. And when we do that, then, then they are much more comfortable. They feel safe, fight or flight diminishes, and then both of us experience less stress. So that, I'm sorry I talked and talked once again, but let's go to questions and answers. And, and I'm going to stop my share um, and turn it back over to you guys. Um, and we can we can do you know we we can do uh, video if anybody wants to do video, feel free. I mean, it's always easier to talk with people than when you see faces. But go ahead. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Judy. That was so good. Judy, that was so wonderful. good. Yeah. I always think it's going to take like five minutes and then, and then it takes a bit longer to work our way through it. Well, and I think you, you set it up well where you, you know, you have to cover the basics, you know, yeah. of, of dementia and you, you, you build the blocks, right? And so, and you did exactly that. So thank you for doing that. Um, we did have a few questions and um, Camille asked, and this was early on when this, for, when this question came up, but it says, does this include Parkinson's dementia? Yeah. 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 You know, the thing with, with, um, like that model, um, losing rational thinking, not intuitive thinking, losing the remembering self, not the experiential self, losing mindfulness, but not losing mindlessness. You, like Alzheimer's to me, the, the pattern with Alzheimer's, that's those people who are losing memory skills first, primarily. So that, the people who eventually will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's, it seems like, you know, that's memory skills. They're forgetful. 
and it takes a while. It's not rational thinking that's first to go, but then there's, you know, like with cardiovascular disease induced dementias, um, you know, other, other dementias, people start losing rational thinking skills before memory skills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm seeing more and more people diagnosed with ADHD in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Well, are we sure? I mean, to me, maybe that's a dementia where somebody's losing their, their attention skills first. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't come out yet. But, you know, each different type of dementia that's that's a result of a different disease or the result of a different event or the result of a different lifestyle choice. It's going to be, you know, it, it, um, we all end up in the same place, but they, they have different markers. So mm -hmm. like the person who's experiencing Lewy body or frontal temporal lobe, you know, now we're seeing added into that, we're going to see complications with delusions and hallucinations, but not just for those people, because when we lose rational thinking skills and we fall asleep, even if we fall asleep for a few minutes for a nap and wake up again, whatever it was we dreamed remains true, remains real. And when that happens, it can look like it's a delusion or look like a hallucination. So, you know, I've, I, 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 it took me about five years to see the pattern. And then, you know, since then, I guess that was 2010 when I began. And I'm still looking for somebody who breaks the pattern. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's there. We all end up in the same place. But that, um, when you start looking at the skills and you're looking for what skills they're still using, then you can see where the strengths are and what you need to support, what you don't need to support. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mary asks, can you provide an example of how you use the Dawn method with your neighbor or an elderly person? Wow. Um, a thousand <laughs> examples. <laughs> okay. So, so here's one. And I, I'm pretty sure I put this in my book, one of the books, but um, I'll never forget this man because he was in such torment. And we came in late, really late. Um, so I was, you know, this is when I was working with clients in Moscow and, and this gentleman, let me think this through. So I think he and his wife married out of high school, high school sweethearts. He ended up um, in the Air Force for his entire adult life. Um, they settle in a small town outside of Moscow, buy a house, live in it for about 20 years, she dies. Now he's been there alone for about three years. And of course, as often happens, he isolated, um, you know, he wasn't a really a gregarious person. And he's in his mid eighties living alone in the house where they lived in for a couple of decades. The kids live elsewhere, they call us in. And very early on, um, the daughter says, okay, well, yeah, we're gonna hire you, we need help. Dad needs help. Um, here's the biggest problem. He wakes up in the middle of the night, he reaches over, mom's not, and he panics. So he jumps out of bed and he starts going around the house and he's looking for her and he can't mm -hmm. find her. So what's he do? You know, this, this is somebody who's experiencing dementia. He doesn't have memory skills. So he doesn't recall that she died three years ago. He doesn't recall living alone for years. He doesn't recall the funeral or the loss or her extended illness. All of that has been wiped out of his mind because he can't handle it it's gone and he doesn't have rational thinking. So for him, when he wakes up in the night and his wife isn't there, there's only one reason that could possibly have happened. She's been kidnapped. And so after about a minute, off he goes to the phone, he grabs the phone and he dials 911 and he gets the local sheriff's department. He says, help, get somebody out here right away. My wife's been kidnapped. <laughs> and you know, that's a real problem, Judy, because the sheriffs are real fed up. The next time they have to come out and he starts swinging at them, they're going to put handcuffs on him and put him and take him down and put him in a, in a jail cell and call us. And, and we would have to, um, I think at that point, the, the one who lived the closest was probably a three hour plane right away. Mm. Can you help? And so, okay, well, what would we normally do? Now, if you're looking at dementia as something that makes people crazy, that's pretty crazy, right? And uh, that's our police force. That's the way it's designed in the state of Idaho. If uh, dementia is not defined as mental illness, which it isn't, 
And so they can't put them in the emergency room. They have to put them in a cell until a mm. family member comes. The longest I heard about was a man who was left in a cell for 27 days before they could oh. convince family to appear. I said, not a problem, I'll help. Here is my dawn approach. <laughs> so I go to the sheriff's department the next morning and I say, hey, um, we're going to start working with John Smith. And uh, I understand he calls you guys in the middle of the night. He thinks his wife's been kidnapped. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to put him in a cell. You got to do something about that. He's taking a swing. He gets really angry and he's going to he's going to hit one of us and there's going to be charges. And I said, OK, here's the deal. The next time he calls you, call me. Here's my cell phone number. Call me. Give me five minutes before you send a car. I promise you, let me talk to him and I'll call you back. OK, so. That night or a night or two later, phone rings about 2 a.m. Here's my cell. It rings. Sheriffs. It's like, hey, yeah, we heard from John Smith. Can you give him a call? Sure. Okay. So I call John. Hey, John, it's Judy. How are you? How am I? Fine, Judy. I said, yeah, yeah, you, I'm new. You just met me yesterday, and, and I'm your daughter's friend, and uh, you probably don't even remember me because, like, I'm not very remarkable. But how's it going? And he says, well, it's not good at all. My wife's been kidnapped and those sheriffs have not shown up. They don't believe me. And I said, oh my goodness, that's terrible. Oh, that's terrible, John. I'm so, so sorry. So like, is her purse gone? Is her coat gone? He says, well, I, I, I don't know. I said, well, well, go ahead, put the phone down, go and check. This is important. Go see if her, if her coat and her purse are gone. He goes to the closet, he comes back and he says, yeah, they're gone, they're not there. Okay. Well, then she's got her purse and her coat. That's good. Okay, well, what about her car? Did she take her car? Now, I, of course, know that she doesn't have a purse and a coat in that building any longer. It's long gone. I know the car was a 1972 Toyota Corolla, and I know it's been gone 15 years. But I also know that he doesn't know that. He's upset. So what I am going to do is help him reinterpret reality in a manner that is safe for him and more comfortable. And so I say, check, go see if her car is gone. Okay, just a minute. Comes back to the phone, he says, no, car is gone too. And I said, oh, okay, so, so she's got her purse, she's got her coat, she's got her car. You guys have some really good friends. Wasn't your daughter telling me about your really good friends? You know, it was like, you, you guys, you went to high school together, you raised your kids together. Oh, you mean George and Anne. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I always forget people's names. But, well, they're nice people. Where do they live? Oh, they live over in Sun River, Oregon. Boy, did your wife like visiting them? Oh, yeah, yeah. They really got along well. Anne and, oh, my married boy, they really got along well. You're such a good husband. So she's, so Mary and Anne are really good friends. Yeah, yeah. She just loves visiting George and Anne. She's probably over there right now. Oh, okay, well, you know, hey, so I'm going to drop by and see you tomorrow morning. I should probably get going, but hey, it's lovely chatting with you. And we hang up. Now, what has happened? So I have changed his perception of the present. I've given him a more pleasant interpretation of what's going on around him. Now, functionally, as this happened, and I think it went on for, I don't know, a couple of months, that I'd get these phone calls and, and it, it tapered off. Gradually it tapered off. Um, I probably, I still wake up at 2 a.m. quite often, but here's what happened. He began to associate a happy phone call with a friend, somebody who was not upset, not concerned, mm -hmm. not frustrated, not angry. I was just happy to chit chat. He didn't have rational thinking, so it never occurred to him that it was kind of crazy to call up this person or have a phone call from somebody named Judy in the middle of the night. But I led him through the experience of being with friends and experiencing companionship during the night. And gradually, when he would wake up, those feelings replaced. The feelings of, where's my wife? I'm here alone. The side of Her side of the bed is cold. And I'm working with his skills. I'm working with his inability to use rational thinking and his inability to use memory skills. And I'm helping him enjoy life. So to me, that, that's one example. I, I give you many, but 
should probably go to another question. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a great one. That's a great one, Judy, because it, the way you, the verbiage you use made it very non-threatening. It made it very um, not condescending, you know, where, not, you were, yeah. where, you were, where you were not telling him that he was wrong or no. this is what really happened. It was very, it, that's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> well, you know, it's the way we should be, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's how we were kids. We don't, we don't, you know, we don't, we aren't condescending to, um, to the five-year-old because they don't get it the way we as adults do. Sure. And, and, you know, and, and in daily life, all of us have differing cognitive skills. None of us have the same skills. Some of us have really good memory skills. They accommodate the rest of us all the time. Some of us have really good rational thinking skills. They accommodate the rest of us all the time. We are always accommodating our varying cognitive skills so we can do that for people when they experience dementia and have more profound losses too. Right. Good. Just being yep. kind. Good. Okay. And Judy, there are a few more questions that I, I want to go ahead and ask. Um, Teresa asked, so are you saying that there really is no need to give my dementia loved one the recommended drugs of Namenda and Aricept that the neurologist prescribed? Okay, so I'm not a doctor and I am a lawyer, so I'm going to make a good, careful <laughs> answer. But here's what I did. Here's what I did, because I'm not, I'm not a neurologist. Um, I signed up for Medscape.com. And that gave me access to reading all the medical studies of the world. And then I signed up for SSRN.com. And that gave me access to all the psychology, psychiatry studies, as well as all the legal stuff. And I put in the search terms, dementia, drugs, Alzheimer's. And here's what I came up with. And you guys should do it for yourselves to answer that question. Um, I, did, I saw that if the company that, that marketed the drug ran and paid for the study, it mm -hmm. showed a possible improvement. And if the study was run by somebody in Britain, because that's where they generally run all the studies that a drug company would want run here in the United States, it showed no improvement. And those drugs have side effects. Not as bad as psychotropic drugs, but they have side effects, like dizziness and confusion. And that would be the last thing I'd want to do to my loved one, give them more dizziness or give them more confusion. So um, it's, it is a family's decision but I would read, read the studies. Um, I don't think doctors have time. They don't have time to stay up on all this stuff, right? There are HMOs require that they only spend what, 14 minutes with somebody in a, an appointment. They have to work all day and uh, see people constantly back to back. They barely have time to read our, our charts. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I guess what I should say, I have one, if we want to talk about drugs, I have one anecdotal experience where I saw a drug have a positive effect. And that was a man who was a psychiatrist, his son, or no, his son was a psychiatrist, he was a surgeon. Um, in his early 60s, he was absolutely convinced that he was experiencing mild cognitive impairment. He could see a change in his skills. And he went to, his son joined him in going to bed with trying to get a prescription for Aricept, um, even though he did not, he was not symptomatic with dementia from a medical perspective. They couldn't get the health insurance company to pay for it because he didn't have a diagnosis. But he took it for about a decade and he eventually um, had Alzheimer's. But it seemed that taking that drug prior to being symptomatic, that it might have slowed it down. And I've, I've heard that from two other sources, anecdotal, not tested, but um, I think it helped him. But that was because he was pre-symptomatic. Yeah. He wasn't already experiencing dementia. Roseanne is not in. <laughs> so. That's part of the issues is that what they're finding is you have to start taking these drugs before any symptoms happen, but the symptoms yes. are what shows you if there's a problem. And that's yes. part of, it's that hamster wheel of, well, when yeah. do you take these drugs? Because once it's started, it's started. Yep. 
That's right. And uh, maybe we're slowing it down, but there's no proof. You know, no. it has never shown up in a study. No. Oh. Okay. Christina, I think more. somebody had their hand up. Yep. Someone did have their hand up. Kara, did you, I'm not sure if it's Kara or Kara, so I want to be respectful of that, but did you, I, I understand that you have a scenario that you want to go through. Hi, my name is Kara, and um, I am actually a um, social worker in a neurology clinic. And oh, my wow. question, yeah, so my question is, and, and I love a positive approach to behavior, but I have a, I have a client whose wife ha is in her 50s and has early onset. And so I'm a therapist and I see caregivers and patients, but of course I can't work with memory disorder patients because there's no continuity of care there when they have no memory. But his wife is obsessed with Disney yeah. and owns, has a whole room full of stuff. Um, and he's trying to be accommodating, but he's also got a budget, right? Like she yeah. wants the new iPhone and she wants yeah. the Disney purse and she has 50 Disney purses. So what I'm wondering is, um, so what happens when he tries to redirect her or she has no short-term memory. So he's ordered the phone, the phone's in a, a container in Long Beach and finally he gets the phone, um, but she can't remember that he ordered it. And every time something she perceives as negative, she tells him he hates her, he doesn't take care of her. And what I'm wondering is, um, when you can't keep spending money, and when your loved one is combative and has a self-esteem level that makes them rage at you, mm -hmm. where, how do you hold space for their feelings but also keep a functional household, you know? Cause I think it's, it's, it's most, at some phase of dementia, we're gonna have combativeness. We're gonna have resistance and anger and difficult behavior. So what does a caregiver do in that kind of situation using Dawn? You know, you gotta go back to the very beginning. That's why it takes me eight weeks. I never let, you know, because people say to me, oh, yeah, well, you could just teach us two hours Friday night, six mm -hmm, hours mm -hmm. Saturday, bam, bam, done. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Because what you're talking about is a woman who does not have a sense of security in that home, in that stuff, or in that man. And she has to relearn it. Because the dance has changed. The two of them had a relationship. Their relationship was working. We're going to assume their relationship worked, was working, but at least we know it used to be better than it is now. And now she's operating with fewer skills. And it is making life miserable for both people. It goes back to security, sense of security. There's the, we can't give her back memory skills. We can't give her back short-term memory. We can't give her back all three, all five attention skills. She's stuck with intensity and focus. Right. We could, we can't change that, but we have, to, we can only go to the beginning and change how secure she feels. So, you know, what I, what I, what I see with, um, you know, like, especially with couples mm -hmm. where, where this is, um, they're, they're pretty far in on this, aren't they? They've got some really ingrained habitual behaviors. When you say raging. Yeah, she's, she's already, he's targeted. He's the bad guy. Well, I want to, I want to just interject that she has the, she's, um, she's got a genetic form of, of memory loss from um, Mexico. Like she's in this very particular group study and yeah. she's pretty young, but she got fired because of this. And she was probably dementing long before she was fired. So her PTSD from work yeah is now all on him. So I don't know the quality of their relationship yeah. before, but he's the only one around her. Is it? Yeah. Because yeah. if, if I'm losing rational thinking skills, the mm -hmm. nearest person to me yep. is, even though that person is the person who's giving me the most support and love, yes. that's the bad guy. You know, so one of the things I teach in, with the Dawn Method is, is especially if you are a couple, yeah. you've got to have a distant third party. you got to have a bad guy that's mm -hmm. causing problems for the both of you so that the two of you can be team, a team okay. who tries to make the best of the life yourself together. But you, if you can't, he's not going to be able to partner with her until there's a reason outside of them. 
that's the cause of all of her troubles. So if it was, you know, with, and it's so hard with like a scenario because you you know so much more that, that um, you don't know really matters. That's critical for me to know before I answer, but I can tell you one thing. There needs to be somebody who's responsible for that iPhone not being in her hands and it needs to be not him. Got it. Yeah. So how do so. they access Dawn with you? Um, the website is the Dawn method. Okay. And um, I'm, you know, I, I'm, we, I teach families over eight weeks. And one of my Dawn trainers in training is on here today. I saw Terry. There's Terry Skoog is here today, and she's working her way through it. Um, either I teach or a Dawn trainer teaches families, but um, it, it's that. And then I have the home care product, you know, for people who can't afford the private classes. The okay. the books are there, but um, you know, it's not. It it's just changing your perspective. Okay. And but you have to go back to the beginning and, and you know, I do, um, you know, uh, uh, consult uh, like this, this year I've been um, meeting with a caregiver support group in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, mm -hmm. and I meet with them, I've been meeting with them a couple times a week. And it's, for me, it's so difficult because, you know, like um, the person, you're, you're going to have these problems. And, and if you don't begin at the beginning where you're helping this individual come, come to believe and feel safe, feel safe with you, um, their interpreter, their guide, their coach, their protector, as they're going through finding themselves less and less able, mm -hmm. that's the only way to avoid fight or flight. But um, it, we get into such difficult things. Um, everybody who experiences dementia ends up having to grapple with their worst fear. Right. So a lot of women, a lot of us, mm -hmm. we find ourselves absolutely convinced that our husbands <laughs> are cheating on us. Right. And, right. Right. Or, or the other one is, um, you know, that somebody's stealing my clothing, my makeup, my jewelry, yes. the stuff that mm -hmm. makes me me uh, and, and a person. And so we have these default, um, you know, where, where we are, our subconscious presenting to us in dream, what our worst mm -hmm. nightmare is. And then we don't have the rational skills or the memory skills to deal with it. And so we need our, our companions to help us. Um, sorry, uh, Cara, I feel like I'm just going all over the place, but there's no, no, I, I think no it, short answer. Well, you, but I think have, it brings up that issue that we forget. And, and I, as a therapist, you know, life happens and then yeah. you get sick and it and all your unfinished business comes yeah. stacking up in the back yeah yeah and, and so it's hard right and so and like it's really hard for us like i remember one of my clients she her daughter had spent her entire adult years in new york city you know always at a distance and so this woman was you know mm -hmm. her entire life she kind of grieved that her daughter wasn't around so she begins to experience dementia. This daughter quits this really um, high paying, prestigious position and comes home to live next door to mom. And guess what happens? Every time she like she's there, she's living in a double wide trailer beside mom. And every time she goes down the hall to use the bathroom, mom turns to the caregiver and tear, her eyes fill up with tears. And she says, my daughter, she left right after high school. I never get to see her. She deserted me. I miss her so much. Now the daughter is gonna be so hurt, right? After all, she's given up for mom. But what about mom? Mom doesn't have memory. Now, if I recognize that she does not have memory skills, then I am going to help the daughter by explaining this, this grief of hers is valid. We must accept and and grieve with her so when you go to the bathroom the caregiver is going to grieve with your mom and then she's going to say i know you know and and for me i could say i know my son he moved to europe and if i ever want to see him 17 years he's lived in europe i i miss him isn't it terrible to miss your child but you know what she's here she's visiting and so that mother and daughter had this joyful reunion six times a day. 
-hmm. the daughter reappeared. But mm -hmm. now we were using, it's Naomi Thiel, right? We were right. validating her emotion. Whatever emotion I am feeling due to the fact that I do not have certain skills and I cannot interpret reality the way I once did and the way everybody around me is, whatever I'm feeling is valid. If you validate my feelings, then then you are building relationship with me, not destroying it. And if it's if you're a couple and you're not validating her or his feelings that are due to this loss of skills, you're not going to have a relationship. It is going to get ugly. But you know, you you'd said that with dementia, it would always end up with combative behaviors. No, it doesn't. I've I've had I've had people who um who you would think would end up physically violent, who I was able to take through the end of life so they could die at home and they never became combative or violent. And it's it's only works if you figure out what's going on with that person, what's their security symbol. Well, I'd like, like to just say, most of us are not trained to feel our feelings. I mean, come on, right. the culture yeah. says, suck yeah. it up, buttercup, yeah. and yeah. just keep moving and don't complain. And right. so I think, and when you talk about male caregivers, when do they ever get to feel, you know, men are angry or happy, like their range of emotions. So to see your loved one tell you that they're not safe and you're doing everything to keep your lives safe must be infuriating. And then he's grieving because you're not you. Yep. And he's supposed to be empathic. I mean, I don't think most yeah. of us don't get that. I just don't think it's a very, um, I think you're right. If we had these skills, we wouldn't go to the combativeness, but we're grieving and we want things to be fixed. We want the pill. Anyway, yeah. I don't want to take up too much time, but I appreciate you in this. Yeah. But that's, that's part of it. And that's not where you validate it's not that's your daughter she's been here all day don't you know who that is that's not what you do that's the opposite of dawn so it's i know i feel bad too and you go with it you have to get in with them and that's part of it but that's also what makes it so hard because you love this person or you're caring for this person you might not love them but whatever you're in it every day and this is affecting you and you have to take that and put that in your back pocket while you're doing this. It's the only way it works, but that's what makes caregiving so much harder than everything else. And that's what adds to the stress and the exhaustion and the grief that we carry on a daily basis because we're doing this and you have to learn a new language. And you don't want to learn this language because you want this to be done. You want this to be better. You want, the, you want to fix your person. You want to help them. And no matter what you do, it's just going to continue. So you have to get in with them. And that's, I'm sorry, that's part of it. <laughs> that's so well said, Roseanne. So well said. That's part yeah. of it. So. But you know, we are all able, all of us are equipped with the ability to learn. Yes. And we can do it. Yes. yes. We can't, you know, you can't take a pill and get in touch with your emotions, but. No. We can lead them. And, and, uh, you know, Kara, that's what you do. So you know it. You you know it better than than the rest of us how to lead people and how how to help people get more in touch with their own emotions. So and Judy's, can... your books are your books are fantastic. Your books are your books are. <laughs> <laughs> you want the other one? Here's the other one. Right, yeah. they're fantastic. And we did a whole we did a whole. Um, what behavior episode yeah on yeah want to go home and all of that so yeah. but sorry christine go ahead i'm sorry <laughs> no no nothing that's it's exactly right i i do um you know while we obviously we're getting we're getting later so if mm -hmm. for those that want to stay on as we go through some of these other questions if it'll be helpful for you to listen into um some of judy's re responses i you know we definitely encourage you to stay on if you need to hop off that's totally okay. We know that um, some of you are on the East Coast and it's getting late, so uh, we want to be respectful of your time. But um, there are some more questions to Judy, and I think some of them okay. will be, they're more practical kind of caregiving questions, so I do want to ask them to see yeah. how, yeah. you know, see if you can give some insight. But um, the next one says, I'm dealing with my mother, and this is from Kate. 
I'm dealing with my mother who has always been emotionally shut down. So I can't read her emotional responses to her dementia. Any ideas on how to handle this? Wow. Um, you know, I, you have to go back to the beginning. So you, you start with the assumption that she's got security issues, that she feels at risk, that she feels, feels insecure. And if you start there, then, um, you know, that, that's where you have to begin. You have to begin with security. And uh, then you can start working towards um, you know, the well-being. I've, I've, you know, with the, when I'm teaching the Dawn Method, when people uh, sign up, they, they get a year's access to these 36 little videos that deal with the 36 issues. Um, with the Dawn Method, or, or you know, that the, the Dawn Method will break down into. I've had people complain that in the first couple of videos, they're not getting any tips and techniques. Well, you're not. I mean, I can't make it simple. You know, we, we there's nothing simple about dementia. If it was simple, nobody'd be here. If it was simple, we'd all be doing it. We'd all be great dementia caregivers. We'd all be wonderful companions. It wouldn't even be a problem in society. It'd just be a part of life, like raising children, but it's not simple and it's really complex. It's complex because people are complex beings. We're not, we are not computers. We are not robots. We are not machines. We're really, really complex. And when we have emotion, emotional reactions and our emotions are based on, you know, it, it our personalities affect it, our previous life experiences affect it, everything affects how we feel. So the way to start, if you really don't know this person that you've ended up taking care of, is going back to the beginning, learning about how you could support a person who's losing these very specific skills, and how you could help them begin to feel safe, develop a sense of safety. If, you know, when we had people living at home alone with dementia, and, and it was a couple of years before I even understood that this wandering was a real problem. And it was because we were teaching people that the safe place to be was inside their own home. And that was the thing. I want everybody to feel safe at home and not feel safe leaving home unless they were with one of their companions. And, and so that's, you know, when you don't know a person well, it's just like, when you're caring for people in a care facility and when you're a professional caregiver, you have to just kind of assume that the beginning of the problem is gonna be a security need. And then you can go on to enriching their life and adding beauty with well-being. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and Rebecca states that she loves this model and she has read the book. And how can we implement any of this in an affordable way? For example, if I take mom to coffee and, and someone comes in to clean the house or bring groceries, ultimately, I probably need eight plus hours a week, probably much more. It gets very expensive. And she, Rebecca, is asking as an area agency um, on aging employee and trying to find resources for those who don't have income. Wow. Yeah, it is really hard to find resources for people who don't have income. I, my uh, blessings on everybody who works at an area agency on aging. Um, and every state is different that, um, you know, how they've accessed the funding and how they've set up um, their uh, delivery of services. But, you know, the, the cheapest thing to do is read the book and to, to start to recognize these skills that we lose, which ones we keep, which ones we lose, doesn't cost any money at all. And, and if you are able to not ignite fight or flight, then you're not going to be experiencing as much emotional trauma yourself. If both of you are more emotionally comfortable more of the time, you're going to be able to, um, you know, avoid having outside caregivers come in for as many hours. Um, but, you know, this this is the country that doesn't have paid child care or family care leave. You know, we just don't provide resources that support families. So that's a really hard one. 
Yeah, that this is something we talk about often in our in our daughterhood circle, in our San Diego daughterhood circle group is about, you know, what are the resources? How do we afford this? And yeah, you know, I when I talk with people in Britain, um, I remember one caregiver, she just was distraught, just beside herself. And she said, you know, I'm tr I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. I'm looking after mom. I'm an only child. My husband doesn't help. It's just me. And the government, they only give me eight hours out of 24 of paid caregiver help. What am I supposed to do? And I'm like, eight hours oh, is wait, good. wait, wait a minute. <laughs> hold, hold, hold on. Wait a minute. I'm in America. Yeah. You get how many hours a day? And she said, well, only eight, seven days a week. Yeah, but it's only eight hours a day. Oh, seriously. Oh, man. I don't know how you're doing it. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, that's, that's America. Yeah. We don't have resources. I'm, I'm sorry. I know. And over here, we're jealous about the eight hours a day. Oh, we ever imagine if you, if we had eight hours a day. Yeah. But yeah. did that person, that person didn't have dementia? The, the mom did. Yeah. Did she? Okay. Yeah. Cause I thought they had that dementia tax over there too. <laughs> I, this was last, um, this is 2020, so okay. not 2021, but uh, God bless. I just thought, wow. That's boy, wonderful. What a, what a resource. Okay. Could and you then, imagine? <laughs> Could you nope. imagine? Nope, I know. can't. All right. <laughs> Um, and then Judy, Eve asked, um, and, and you kind of addressed this, but do you teach the Dawn method to others so we can help families? Is it evidence-based? Um, we just had the University of Alabama student there just did a, the, that'd be the first study. Um, actually, evidence-based, evidence I don't think we've got evidence-based anything. Mm. The Alzheimer's Association provides classes. I have never heard of an evidence study on their classes. Mm -hmm. um, here in the United States, we began in the 1920s using appropriate care and reality orientation for people with dementia. I've never heard of an evidence-based study that uh, proves that that is the appropriate way to deal with someone when they're experiencing dementia. Mm -hmm. um, the University of Nevada uh, made it to the second round of uh, uh, money funding and got turned down, but um, Jason said he's not going to give up and he's going to be doing an evidence-based study on Dawn uh, 2022. So uh, oh, that's, that's exciting. is anybody doing evidence-based studies on any dementia care yet? Um, contented dementia, I don't think there's been one there. I know Alan Power went to Guelph last I heard to, a, to try to do something there in Canada. Um, yeah, there's not much money. If I had a quarter of a million dollars, I'd have probably, mm -hmm. you know, funded it. But uh, mm -hmm. that's just the start. You need at least a quarter million. Wow. Okay. Um, and then Terry B wants to know, how do your two books work together? Should one be read first before the other? Um, I wrote to two different learning styles. So if you are just wanting to, know, so the Dementia Handbook is real small. It took two hours to have it voiced on Audible. Um, I wrote it so you could slip it into your briefcase, slip it into a purse, read it on the way to work and finish reading it on the way back. Um, I wrote it as if I was writing a memoranda to the chief justices at the Oregon Supreme Court because that's how we wrote memoranda when I was there. Uh, it's a recitation of uh, what I found to be true. There's, I included no examples, well, very few, and uh, no support. Then the other book, Dementia with Dignity, is written for the person who likes to see how. Give me an example. The person who understands and learns through anecdote um, rather than rational thinking and memory. And so the Dementia with Dignity is written for those of us who would be um, or more of kinetic learners, and that gives lots of examples. So both books um, detail the seven emo tools, which are the seven emotional needs that um, dementia causes, this loss of skills causes, and um, 
if you, and I think I say that, don't I, Roseanne, in the yeah. Dementia Handbook, I say, okay, you've read two chapters, that's all you need. If you, yes. if you're really, if you've got it, you're done already. Don't bother yep. reading the rest of the book. And, yep. yep. Yeah. And this one's much different. Yeah. Yeah. That mm -hmm. one I'm giving examples. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Judy, I do have a question around that. You you mentioned that, um, you know, in your first book that that one was available in Audible. Are they both available in Audible? It would have cost over $10,000 to get the uh, Dementia with Dignity voiced. Okay. I haven't done it yet. Got it. No. And, and the reason why I ask is, is because yeah. I'm such a fan of audio, um, yeah. especially for caregivers because yeah. we're busy, yeah. right? Yeah, and, so, and you can just have a bun, earbud. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And so um, that's the reason why I ask. I mean, the, the audio I think yeah. is really important for busy people and busy caregivers, which is yeah. why I think you should all listen to the podcast, Roseanne's <laughs> podcast, because podcast. there is so yeah. much great information on there and it is all available in audio. And yeah. um, so if you haven't subscribed you. to that yet, please do. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, we, yes. had, we covered a lot. We covered a lot. Yeah. In, our, in our podcast. Uh, there was one other question about fawn. What is fawn? You said uh, flight, fight, oh, right. freeze, yeah. or fawn. So yeah, we've always talked about fight or flight, you know, stress responses, but more and more, and if you just Google the four Fs of stress. Um, so some of us, our, our knee-jerk reaction is fight. Some of it, it's fear, it's flight. Um, some people freeze, you know, right. when something's stressful, they just freeze. And then some people, it's kind of like Stockholm Syndrome, FAWN, F-A-W-N, is for those of us who, when we find ourselves in a very stressful situation, we want to make everything okay and make sure everybody's happy so that nobody gets hurt. That's, that's kind of the, you know, let's make sure those in charge are um, not, yeah, we're not at risk. That's another one of our reactions. But there's some really good articles now. Um, on the four F's of stress. And, you know, really, I think the simplest way to look at dementia is these are, when I'm experiencing dementia, I'm a human being who's going to be exhibiting stress responses constantly because I'm losing skills. And all of a sudden, I can't do what I always could. So, and I keep finding myself being, you know, uh, out of touch with what everybody else seems to think is true very stressful. Good. Okay. Um, and let's see what other questions. I think we got through all the questions. There was, um, Terry did ask about how she could join a daughterhood circle. And yeah, so she asked about how to join a daughterhood circle. So mm -hmm. if you go to the daughterhood.org website, then you will be, and you go to uh, circles, to daughterhood circles, you'll see basically anywhere in the country where there is currently a daughterhood circle um, set up. However, you know, we're, we're in the age, we're living in the age of coronavirus, right? You know, Karen and I used to host our daughterhood circles in person. We used to meet regularly. And now just like everything else, we're all on, we're all on Zoom. So if there isn't one in your area, you know, Roseanne, her, she's a circle leader as well. She's hosting in, in, Philadelphia, but you guys are meeting over Zoom too, right? We are. Yep. 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 So if you don't have a local one, if you go to the website and there isn't one, you know, near you in your city, we're we're virtual now. So you can join anyone that you'd like. Um, any of you are welcome to join Roseanne's. I'm sure you're welcome to join Karen and I's in San Diego. Um, and I I'm pretty sure that Susan Rowe, who who updates that website, she she will update it regularly. She always asks us circle leaders when we're having our next one. And so you will be able to see there um, when there is a next circle meeting. So if you're looking for one really soon, go through that website and see when the next one is. Um, for Karen and I in San Diego, we host ours on the third Thursday of every single month. So that's the reason why this, this event is happening right now is because this was meant to be for our, you know, for our San Diego circle. And we just decided let's just take this one nationally because this is such good information that everyone should know. So um, yeah, what else? Anything else about circles that I should mention, Karen or Roseanne? No, I think you covered it. Okay. There should be, there's one for everyone. <laughs> and, and they are lifesavers, totally lifesavers. Yeah. And if you wanted to, you could come and join different circles and, and check whichever one you want to 
connect with, but I am partial to San Diego. So there is that. <laughs> Listen, I'm partial to San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Okay. Well, you're getting a lot of, um, you know, just really positive feedback on here, Jody, about, you know, that this was all very helpful, great information, um, very enlightening. So oh, good. Yeah, good. extremely helpful. So just a lot of, yeah, a lot of good vibes. Good. Well, thank you for inviting me, you guys. Always great to see you. And, and uh, I'm glad to take part. Judy, you're the best. Really? Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. You. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for um, spending your evening with us. And um, yeah. yeah, go to the daughterhood.org website if you have any more questions, if you want to reach out. Um, you yeah. can find the podcast there too. The podcast, find the podcast there yeah. and anywhere you listen to your podcast. Yes. And this is going to be recorded. Um, it is being recorded. So this will be up. Susan will have this up on YouTube, you know, probably do a little bit of minor editing. This will be up in the next few days. Probably early next week at the latest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Sounds great. which means that if you haven't subscribed yet to their YouTube channel that you should. Mm -hmm. And we'll send out an email about that once it's up to everyone who was here tonight. Oh, great. Okay. That's great. So we'll get the link as well. Good. Awesome. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. All right, everyone, daughters, have a good evening.